didn't know, I didn't even know my own self because I just wanted to make everybody around me happy and maybe I would find happiness if I saw them happy. But when they were angry, I, I felt like I took that really to heart and it just broke me down. And the only way I was able to get out was through smoking or drinking or doing something that just got me away from it. I just wanted to be in a fog, in a cloud, somewhere where nothing existed that was real. And I lived that almost all my life, ever since my dad passed away um, from cancer. And then after that, I just went a whole spiral. I was being beaten. I was being um, sexually abused. I was being uh, abused by people I had relationships with. And I ended up taking relationships that weren't really that great. I made really bad decisions with people. and. Um, I just got tired. I, I just started crying and I couldn't stop crying and it, it hurt me so much. I just didn't know what I needed and I just was sobbing and I was calling my oldest sister. She's like my mentor. I love my sister. She's been praying for me since like day one and she never stopped. She never, even when I would throw out the meanest things, I didn't believe. She was going through cancer. She lost all her hair. She would joke around about it and call herself G.I. Jane. But for me, I lost my dad to cancer. To see my sister go through cancer, to me, it was hard because I was just like, what God are you talking about? Because I don't get it. And um, that night when I was crying, I didn't want to call her again because I've been calling. I called her like 15 times a day. I was going through some stuff and she would be preaching and preaching to me. I just looked straight into my Bible uh, when, I, when I was crying and I actually reached up and I finally grabbed it. The scripture that I ended up falling upon was uh, Luke 8, is a parable of the seed, and it, it talks about the seed, the seed that fell on the path, the seed that fell on the rocks, and the seed that fell um, with the weeds. And for me, I, I read that, and I was the seed that fell within the weeds. I was choked up by life's desires. I didn't know how to go about things. I wanted to please people, but I wanted something greater and I didn't know what I wanted and it just totally resonated with me and I just broke down even more. I just fell to my knees and next to my bunny she witnessed my salvation and <laughs> um, I fell to my knees and I asked God to take it all away from me. I couldn't do it anymore. I just cried and I cried and I just wanted more of him and I was like I just I just didn't know how to go about my life without him anymore. And as like my sister tells me that you're this God among all gods, that there's no other God in the world or around ever that could compare to you. And I don't even know what I'm saying right now. I don't even know if this is a prayer, what I'm doing, but I'm on my knees now. I'm bowing down and I just want it all gone. I just want it gone. And that day, February 6th of last year was the best day of my life because I was saved. Um, and then after that, God has never not been there for me. And it's funny because I actually think about before, before I even came to know him, and he was there in each of my moments. I could have died. I could have lost myself. I could have fell into other drugs. I could have not been as, you know, but... It doesn't matter what I was anymore because all that matters to me is who I am now, what that has turned me into and what it keeps growing me to be. My chains are broken, I'm free, and God loved me at my dirtiest point, and he's still here for me now. So that's my story. <laughs> This book, the Bible, is the greatest story ever. And this book, from beginning to end, is a story of salvation. Our God, one God who exists eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God is in the salvation business, and he is writing a story of salvation and good news. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, we read these words, For God so loved the world... It starts with the love of the Father. It starts with the love of God. We don't initiate salvation. We can't. God does. 
And sometimes we think that, the, that God, the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, when he looks at the world and he sees people who are broken and wandering far from him, sometimes we think that God is, is you know, angry at them, disgusted by them, bothered by them. It's God who so loved the world that God the Father, the passage continues, sent his one and only Son, that God the Son, Jesus Christ, came so that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus, shall not perish but have eternal life. God the Father, in love, initiated the plan of salvation. Not because of our goodness, but because of our need. Not because we had it all together, but because we were broken. God the Son came to give his life. Jesus came, God's only Son, to die on the cross, to take our sins, to take our shame, to take our punishment, and to show us the love of the Father. This is the story of the Bible from beginning to end. And then it doesn't end there. Sometimes we think that when a person says, okay, I believe God the Father loves me, I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again, so I accept Jesus Christ, which is, which is the angels of heaven rejoice, it's the greatest moment, like Bree shared in her testimony, the greatest moment of her life. God sees people that are broken and hurting and says, I want to save you. And when they come to that point of salvation, it's amazing. But it doesn't end there. When you come to the cross and receive Jesus, some people think, well, then that's, that's the end, I'm a Christian. No, that's the beginning. You're a follower of Jesus, you're a Christian. So God says, I will send to you my Holy Spirit, the Spirit who's been at work all through history, the Spirit who's at work in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But when a person comes to the cross and receives Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of the living God moves in and lives within them and comes upon their life and says, no, that wasn't the end, that moment of conversion, that moment of receiving Jesus. That was the beginning of a whole new life. And sometimes I think, if I knew all the ways that God wanted to work in my life, and all the things he wanted to do in me and through me, I'd have been like, man, I couldn't have. All I could take at that moment was just understand what Jesus did and accepting him. And then there's this journey of life as the Holy Spirit moves in us and is upon us and guides us. When God looks at this world, and boy, we live in a world that is so fragmented right now. We live in a world where, where just people are pitted against people and group against group and this idea that if you don't agree with me, we hate each other and the, 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 the viciousness and the divisiveness of our world just grows and grows. But when God looks at all of humanity, God only sees two groups of people. God only sees one division. And that is those who've already come to the cross and received Jesus and know the love of the Father and are filled with the Holy Spirit. Those that are Christians. God sees those that, that have already come to know his love and receive it and they're seeking to walk with him and then God sees everyone else as those he longs that they would come to know his love and his grace. And God in his love sent Jesus. And that door is open. So my hope and prayer today is as we think about this, uh, this amazing story of salvation, if you're already a Christian, whether you became a Christian a week ago or five years ago or 85 years ago, you will rejoice today at a deeper level than you have in a long, long time. That you'll be overwhelmed by the greatness of this gift of salvation and be amazed by the power of this spirit that lives in you and this God who wants to lead and guide you all the days of your life. And my prayer is that if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you've not come to that place where you've said, I believe and I receive Jesus and I enter his family, if you've not yet done that, my prayer is that you'll do that today. But I learned something a long time ago as a pastor. I can't force or coerce anybody to do much of anything. You know, I, I have kids, I have a wife, I can barely get them to do what I want them to do, you know? Um, I don't, it, it's, you, know you know what I'm talking about? It's, I, I, as a pastor, I'm not, I, I can't make you change your heart. But my prayer today is that if you know Jesus, you'll take deeper joy and delight in your salvation and live for him with greater passion. And if you don't yet know Jesus, my prayer is that you will say, God, I get it. I see your love. I enter your family. Lord Jesus, speak to us today in your power, for your glory. For those here who have come to the cross, who put their faith in Jesus, who confessed their sins and committed to not only receive Jesus by faith, but to walk with him, Lord, empower us, fill us, and lead us forward with joy and boldness. And Lord, for those people who aren't sure if they've received Jesus or know they haven't, I pray that this would be the day, whether they're here in this room or in the family worship venue or online listening, I pray that this would be the day that they would say yes to Jesus. We pray this in his name and we pray this for his glory. Amen. As I was growing up, 
I knew that there were things that were kind of scary in this world. I, I discovered later as an adult that some of the things that I was most worried about and concerned about as a kid weren't going to be near the problem that I thought they were going to be. I think sometimes when we're kids, we know our need for protection, for salvation. As we get older, we kind of become self-sufficient. So I, I'm good. I'm taking, I can take care of myself. And I think in some ways, when Jesus says we have to become like children to enter the kingdom of heaven, it's we have to realize our need of salvation. But when I was a kid, I had three, I had three big fears that, were, that, were like, that would fill my mind and that would consume me at different times and wouldn't paralyze me, but I, they'd kind of run through my mind at night and they'd concern me. But none of them have panned out to be that big of a deal. First one, killer bees. When I was a kid, there was talk of killer bees, these swarms of killer bees. I imagined myself in the playground with my friends playing and a swarm of killer bees coming all around me and stinging me to death. Did anybody else have, uh, remember the killer bee stuff back in the day? And it's not been near the problem they thought it would be, has it? I mean, I've not had many attacks of killer bees, right? A uh, second thing, as a kid that I was really, I, I read a lot, and I, I, so if you read or watch a Western, or tar, I, I also like Tarzan books, and you know, so in Westerns and, in, and books in the jungle, every single book, at some point, somebody gets stuck in quicksand. <laughs> like quicksand's a big deal, you know? And so as a kid, I thought, man, you gotta watch where you go. You gotta watch where you walk. Close as I've come is like a sand trap when golfing, and it's not nearly as dangerous as quicksand. Um, but you know what I'm talking about? In the, you know, like in the cowboy movie where like almost every movie, some guy gets stuck in the middle of the desert in quicksand and they're slowly going down, right? And, they're, and, they're, and when they're going down in the quicksand, they're not like, this is an interesting phenomenon. They're like, what are they saying? Help! Help! You know, throw me a rope, throw me a vine, throw, reach out to me. There's, they re recognize they're, they're sinking down. And, and then, then in the westerns, the sad moment is kind of like when they cut away and they come back and there's just like a hat sitting on top of, the, you know, the cowboy hat on top of the sand. You're like, that didn't go well, right? Uh, no, no, nobody showed up. And my, 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 thir my third thing, because I grew up in Huntington Beach, California, was tsunamis. You know, I, I, you know, we lived in Huntington, I just imagined that you know, every so, well, what if a just giant wave came and just washed us all away? Now, none of those have been, like, day to day, a big issue in my life. But as a kid, I was, I was aware of these sorts of things. I think right now, for many people, as adults, we look and say, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not in any danger. What we don't know is that what we, where we might actually be, spiritually, is in quicksand with killer bees coming at us and a tsunami on the horizon. Wouldn't that be terrible, right? I mean, but, you know, we go, but we could be, go, we could be sinking down in the midst of this and just not even recognize it spiritually. We can just kind of be like, I'm good, I'm fine. And we don't realize what's really going on. As we talk today about this, this story of salvation, I want you to hear the story uh, again and again and again. I want you to get this message of God's plan of salvation. Because whether we recognize it or not, without Jesus, we're stuck. Without Jesus, we're in quicksand. Without Jesus, we're in trouble. And even if we don't recognize it, it doesn't change the reality. That the end result is not a pleasant one. And so, so we're going to look today and see what God's Word says about salvation. And if you have your uh, books of the Bible... We're going through the New Testament. The story, the story of salvation is just page after page about salvation in Jesus. And three of the books we've, look, we've looked at this last week were Ephesians, Colossians, and Romans. All three of those books, Ephesians, Colossians, and Romans, all letters written to churches in the first century, in each of those books of the Bible, each of those letters, is the story of salvation from the standpoint of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so let, let's begin, if you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, in the book of Ephesians to chapter 1 in Ephesians. Or turn with me in your books of the Bible to the page up on the screen there. And so we should have that. We're going to look at Ephesians 1, verse 3. And we're going to look at this from the standpoint of God, the master storyteller. Listen to these words from Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, listen to these words, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God, our Father, doesn't just love us, didn't just send his son to save us. But he wants to bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now I'm a pastor. I went through, I did a Bible degree in college. I did a master's degree, a master of divinity. And I did a doctoral work all on ministry and Bible stuff. And I can't begin to explain to you what that term means. I, 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 th th this idea that, that God has, has given us every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenly realms in Christ. Some of it we've realized already. Some of it we'll fully realize through eternity. But when you, when you think about the love of God the, God the Father for you, 
He says, I want to bless you beyond your comprehension. The greatest moments of this life, the greatest moments with a person you love, the greatest moments of, of worship and intimacy with God, the greatest moments of, of beauty and, and, and tenderness, you have to go like times, a thousand times, a hundred thousand times, a million, I don't even know, you can't, the, the amount of God's blessings that he has waiting for us for all of eternity is something we can't begin to comprehend. But that's the heart of God the Father. The plan of salvation does not come from a heavenly father who's angry, ticked off, and wants to destroy you. Now, he is holy, holy, holy. And he's concerned about sin. And we're going to talk about that. But the initiation of God's plan of salvation is a God who loves you and wants to bless you with every spiritual blessing, but he gives you every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, in God the Son, who left heaven, who came among us to give his life for us. So the center of the story is the life and the love of Jesus the Son. Look at Ephesians 1, verses 7 to 9. In Ephesians 1, 7 to 9, we read these words. In him... We have redemption through his blood. This is Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for our wrongs and our sins. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Hit the pause button there. What is sin? What is sin? Sin is any thought we think, any thought we think that doesn't perfectly honor God. Ever had one of those? Any thought run through your mind that you're embarrassed about that you wouldn't want any person to know and certainly not a holy, perfect God. But any thought we have that doesn't honor God, that's considered a sin. Sin is any words we speak that are unkind, that are gossipy, that are cutting, that are harsh. Those are sins. Sin is anything we do with our hands and our lives that dishonors God, that isn't perfectly within his will. Sin is even the good things we know we should do that we go, why bother? You say, well, if, that's, if, if sin is thoughts I think that I shouldn't think and things I say I shouldn't say and things I do that I don't do and things I fail to do, you say, I could, I, mean, I could be sinning all day long. Bingo. We've all sinned, the Bible says, and we fall short of God's glory. But in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, because Jesus on the cross paid the price for our sins. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, God the Father initiated this plan of grace. God the Son brought the plan into play in the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I love that word. That God just lavishes his grace on us, just pours it out and pours it out with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That's God's plan through Christ, to lavish us with the grace and the forgiveness of sins that we need, listen closely, even if we don't know we need it. That's his desire. That's his plan. So how does God the Holy Spirit factor in to this work and to this plan in the book of Ephesians? Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the, the gospel, the good news of your salvation. It's all a story of salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God the Father loves us and sees us in our brokenness. He sees, he sees girls and boys, people like Bryn, young people who are struggling and hurting and broken. He sees children and he sees adults and elderly people who just are, don't even know it, but there's this brokenness and God's heart aches for us. He sends Jesus to lavish us with his grace, to pay the price on the cross, to bear our sins and our shame. And then his Holy Spirit, when someone comes to the cross and receives Jesus, listen closely, that's not the end of the deal. For so many people, it's like, well, I became a Christian. I'm done with it now. I'll go to heaven someday. No, that's just the beginning of a whole new life, a whole new journey. And God sends his Holy Spirit, listen closely, to be on us and to be in us. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We don't think about seals a whole lot these days, but what it's talking about is like on a letter or on a scroll, a seal. What will happen is when some, in the ancient world, when somebody would write a letter or do a scroll, they would melt wax and put it on that, on that document, and they would take their seal, a seal like this, or oftentimes a signet ring with their authority, family crest their authority, and when they pressed that and closed it shut, it left a seal. Not just, not just wax, but a marker. And everyone recognized that. If something came from a governor and the governor's seal was on there, it had authority. 
They knew, they knew that, that's, that's coming, that marks who that person is. It came with their authority. The Apostle Paul says when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit not only moves in you, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and becomes like a seal on your life. This marker of the presence of God. And guess what? Far more vivid than this red wax on paper is the Holy Spirit on your life if you're a Christian. He marks you. And people will see that and they will know that you belong to Jesus because you are marked with the Holy Spirit. And then the Apostle Paul takes it to that next, next step. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Spirit's also deposited within us and guarantees all the Bible promises for us for eternity. And the Holy Spirit's presence in us is upon us, marking us so other people can see God's presence and within us, leading us and guiding us. God's plan, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together are in this work of salvation to wash us clean, to give us new life, to give us hope. But that story is told again and again and again. So in the book of Colossians, we hear the story again as the Apostle Paul writes to this church. And so we begin with the master storyteller through the heart of the Father because again, the story of salvation always begins in the heart of the Father. Look at Colossians 1.3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We thank God, our Father, the initiator, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God, our Heavenly Father. We thank him, we praise him. But then Jesus is the one who comes and works out that plan of salvation. He's the center of the story. So we hear of the life and the love of the Son. Colossians 1, 4, and 5 says this. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. They say, we've heard of your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that salvation comes not by our works and what we do? It comes by putting faith in Jesus. Here's the problem in our world. Often as people look and say, well, here, here's probably how it's all going to work. And I've had people tell me this, many people in conversations say, well, you know, I kind of look at it like, you know, I've done some bad stuff, but I've done some good stuff. And if a person does more good than bad, then it kind of, you know, the, 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 the scales kind of tip. And so, you know, here's, here's all my good stuff on the scales of my life. And here's all my bad stuff. And, and if I get to the end of my life and the good stuff just kind of, mm, boom, then the door's open and I go to heaven. But if I have more bad stuff, mm, boom, I'm in trouble, right? And I'm, I'm rejected because I did too many bad things. That's presuming that the weight of our good things can somehow outweigh the weight of our bad things. Here's the problem. One sin, one thought or word or action against God, one, one sin, because our sin is against an infinite God, one sin, boom, is infinitely heavy. And thousands and tens of thousands of sins through a lifetime, there's nothing we can do to tip the scales. Now maybe if I do enough, one more thing, if I can go to church, if I give a bit more money, that's not what saves anybody. Paul says, but it's by faith. Putting your faith in Jesus, that he died on the cross. He paid the price that you couldn't afford to pay. And because Jesus was God with us, he's an infinite being who can offer an infinite sacrifice. We're finite. We can't offer enough. But he offered himself in our place for our sins. That's the good news. And then Colossians continues and, and talks about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in us. Look at Colossians 1, 9, and 10. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding, listen to this, and that the, that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. There's this clear sense that the story's not over. It's still being written. We're living that story today. The story of salvation. Yes, we're saved when we accept Jesus Christ, confess our sin, we come to the altar, come to the cross, whatever term you want to use. When we receive Jesus, we're saved. But our salvation continues on. And, and so he says, he says we, we, now the Holy Spirit helps us know God's will and, and implied live in it, follow his will. Live a life worthy. Man, I, I don't live a life worthy of Jesus. Not one day of my entire Christian life can I say, okay, I'm perfectly worthy of Jesus, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm learning, I'm growing. I don't know, if, for those of you who have been a Christian for a while, you might you know, relate with this, but I look at areas of my life. I've been a Christian now for almost 40 years. And there's things that sometimes, you know, just even in the last you know, three, four months, where the Holy Spirit will just speak to my heart and say, okay, by the way, Kevin, Kevin, the Holy Spirit will just speak. See that attitude right there? How you're behaving, how you're treating people, that attitude right there? 
That's ungodly, and that needs to change. I think, man, I've been a Christian 40 years. I never even paid attention to that. God said, don't worry. That's because we've been dealing with this over here and this and this, you know, and we're growing. And, and, and God, by his spirit, is growing me. You say, well, pastor, is that true? Yes. There's areas that God shows me I need to grow. I'm like, you mean, I've been, just, I've been bumbling that for 40 years? God's like, well, you weren't ready for that yet. We're, we're growing you here. It's a journey that lasts till we see Jesus face to face. But that's what the Holy Spirit does, leads and guides and grows us. As a, now, now, we're not saved by doing the right things or good things. We're saved by faith, by the grace of Jesus, through his death on the cross and accepting him, period. But we are saved to live for God and the Holy Spirit marks us and fills us and leads us to live for him. And, and then in Colossians, the apostle actually circles back up to that heavenly place and the Father's part in this journey of salvation in, in Colossians 1.12, it says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, listen to this, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. God the Father has qualified you. Lest there be any question that I'm gonna see Jesus' face someday and know his grace because I've been good enough. It's the Father who qualifies us. It's Christ who does the work of salvation. It's the Spirit who leads us day by day to walk in the joy of that salvation. But the Father qualifies us. Do not ever think well, I'm going to get to heaven someday because I went to church, because I gave some money, because I helped out with the Awana kids. All those are good things to do, but that doesn't get us to heaven. It's the love of the Father. It's the work and the grace of the Son, and it's the Spirit leading us to walk in that salvation, and it's by faith, by God's grace, not by our works. And so then, back to Christ in Colossians 1, 13 to 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In who? Jesus. Through his work, through his sacrifice. Now right here in Colossians chapter one, verses 15 to 20, is one of the most beautiful declarations of who Jesus is and what he's done. And I'm gonna invite Dale now to come, and Dale is gonna, is gonna read this passage. And I'm gonna ask you just to, to, to keep your eyes open on the screen to think of these words that come out of this passage, but also your ears just to hear, and let God just drive deep into your soul this message of who this Jesus is and what he has done for us and our salvation. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on that cross. Someone say amen. 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 This is the one we gather to worship. This is the one who's won our salvation. And then the book of Romans tells the same story again in, in a profound and, and, and heart-touching way. And the book of Romans, there's pastors that have spent seven, eight, nine years preaching the book of Romans every single Sunday. I'm gonna give you the book of Romans in three minutes when it comes to salvation. And this picture of starting with the Father and then looking at the work of the Son and then the work of the Holy Spirit. The master story, tell her God the Father. We read this, verse 16 of Romans chapter one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. The good news of Jesus and salvation in Jesus is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes and then chronologically, first the Jew, then the Gentile. The message was given to Jewish people first. It's not, that's not priority, that's chronology. All right, First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. 
God the Father initiates the plan and makes it possible for us to be saved if we will come to the cross and confess our sin and receive Jesus Christ. But God the Son entered human history and made a way for us. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. They won't be on the screen, but just listen and drink these into your heart. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though you know, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you hear that? While we were still sinners, we don't clean ourselves up. We don't manage our pain and our sin and our struggles. And say, okay, God, I've cleaned myself up and now I'm ready to present myself to you. We come broken. We come empty. We come and say, God, I can't do it. We are sinking down in quicksand it's about to be a scene with just a hat floating on the quicksand. I mean, we're there. The killer bees are swarming. The tsunami's coming in. And God says, there's nothing you can do, but I love you. I will set you free. And he makes it available to us to receive by faith this gift. He doesn't force us to receive it, but he offers it. And Jesus is the one who's paid the price. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we read these words. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, meaning he's not only Savior, but he now will rule and lead my life. By the Holy Spirit, I'll follow him all my life. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. God the Father offers Jesus. Jesus comes and gives his life and says, even when you're messed up and far from me and rebellious, I still love you. And then the Holy Spirit is at work in our salvation. Romans 8, 14 to 16 says this, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. So that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, to daughtership, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit, listen to this, that we are God's children. That when you know God the Father, when you receive Jesus Christ the Son, and the spirit lives in you, you know, I am a daughter of the living God. I am a son of God. You know it's true. And you walk in that and you live in that. And then you live for Jesus, not because you want to get him to like you and because you're afraid of him. You live for Jesus because he loved you when you were unlovely. He reached out to you when you were sinking and, and about to go down in that last moment. And he said, I offer to you my grace. And, and if you're here today and you've received Jesus and in your need, you cried out and said, Jesus, I can't save myself. I can't, I can't pull myself out of this. I can't deal with my own sin. But I ask for what you did on the cross to be for me. And you take his hand. He has drawn you out and he has saved you. And you belong to him and the spirit lives in you. And my hope for you today is that you will leave this place with the joy of your salvation and with a new passion to live for him, not because you want to get him to like you, but because he loves you right where you are. And he's marked you by his spirit, and he lives in you. And he wants you to walk in the joy of being his son or his daughter. And every day saying, Abba, Father, I'm loved by you. And if you've never received Jesus, I pray that this would be the day that you would say, Jesus, for the first time, I get it. And I say, Jesus, save me and take his hand and receive them. Let's pray together. I want to ask you, if you're here today in the worship center, if you're in the family worship venue, or even if you're online at home, if you know that you've come to the cross, you've received Jesus, and you are his son or daughter, not by your works, but by faith in him, if you know that you're a child of God, wherever you are, family worship venue, worship center, online, will you take one hand and raise it high in the air and keep it up in the air? If you know you belong to God through faith in Jesus, if you're not a hand raiser, I want you to just this one time, raise your hand and keep it up. Lord Jesus, as our hand is lifted up for many people here today, we've received you, we believe in you, we love you. And so we say, oh God, thank you for taking our hand and pulling us out of the pit and calling us your sons and daughters. Thank you for loving us when we were not lovely, when we were not good enough when we were far from you. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price and washing us clean and, and, and taking away our sins and calling us 
children of the heavenly Father. Thank you, Spirit of God, for filling us and marking us. Now lead us forward every day in joy, living for you. Amen. Go ahead and put your hand down. And if you're here today in the worship center in the family worship venue or online, and you're, you're not sure, or you know for certain you've never received Jesus, but you're saying, it make, it, I get it, I get it. I don't have to be perfect, I don't have to fix myself, I have to just surrender to Jesus by faith in his cross and follow him the best I can the rest of my life and into eternity. And that's you today, and you say, and I want to know that Jesus. I want to receive that Jesus right now. I want to have a moment that I can look and say, I know I belong to Jesus. If that's you, if you're in the family worship venue, raise your hand and look up at, look up at Pastor John. He's going to have a prayer in there. And if you're online, uh, just send a note right now online and say, I want to receive Jesus today. And Pastor John's going to, another, another Pastor John's going to talk with you online. And here in the worship center, if you're in this room and you say, I'm not sure, or I know I'm not a believer, but I want to become a follower of Jesus. And this is between you and God, but I want to ask if you would just raise your hand and let God move your hand. Raise your hand and look up at me so I can pray for you right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. To, to publicly receive Jesus Christ. You don't have to pray out loud, just pray in your heart, but just raise your hand if you say, I want to receive Jesus Christ today. Raise your hand high. Okay, and then look up at me real quick so I can see you. Okay, I'm going to pray for you. Good, anybody else? I got big glaring lights, so I'm having a hard time seeing the balcony. If you have your hand, right, okay, right there, good. Good, you, good. okay, and up there, two rows from the top, good. Anybody else? that this would be the day that you would say, and again, okay, two of you right there. Okay, great. So anybody else? And if I'm not seeing you, okay, right over here in the middle of the balcony, good. God sees your hand if I don't recognize you, but I want to be able to pray for you. So anybody else? Okay. And if you don't raise your hand, God sees, okay, right there. Great, fantastic. God sees your hand, and, uh, and it's, it's to him we're praying. So let's, I want to pray for you right now, and if I didn't see your hand, God sees your hand. In your heart, will you pray this prayer to this God who loves you and has given his life for you and who has, is wanting to lead you forward? Say, dear God, before this day, I didn't fully understand. I didn't understand your love for me. I didn't understand that Jesus died on the cross for my wrongs. I didn't understand that he rose again and wants to fill me with his spirit. But I get it today. And I confess my wrongs and I reach up from whatever pit I feel like I'm in or even if I don't know I'm in a pit, I reach up and I take the hand of Jesus and I say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, wash me clean. Jesus, forgive me of all my wrongs and sins. And Jesus, fill me with your spirit so I can live for you and I can follow you all the days of my life. Lord Jesus, thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you are here with us, that you came and you left heaven and you gave your life for us. And thank you that these seven, eight, nine people in this service right here and others in the earlier service, thank you that we can recognize that you have saved us, that you love us, that you've paid the price. We give you thanks and praise. For those who are followers of Jesus in this service right now, in the family worship venue and online, I pray that we will walk in the joy and the strength of our salvation with new passion, knowing that we're walking now with new brothers and sisters who've received you in the first service and now in this service. For those who have made a commitment to you, Jesus, today, I pray you'll help them take next steps forward. And let me say right now here in the worship center in the family worship venue, if you made that commitment today, come forward at the end of the service. And we want to give you a Bible. I want to give you a hug or a handshake, whatever you're comfortable with, and welcome you into God's family. And so would you come and just give us about four or five minutes, and then Pastor Keith and Patty want to just make sure we can connect you to any way that will help you start growing in next steps of faith. In the first service, we had one person raise their hand and two people come forward. So we had twice as many people come forward as raised their hands. And so if you prayed and didn't raise your hand, come forward and let us give you a Bible. If you're in the family worship venue, talk with Pastor John. And if you're online, send us a note and say, how can I start growing in my faith? Lord Jesus, send us from here and the joy of your salvation. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. If you want prayer, come forward for other pastors for prayer. If you, if you raise your hand and pray to receive Jesus, please come and give me four or five minutes. And also, if you're new, go by the Connection Center. Tell them you're new, and they'll give you a, a, they'll, they'll give you a gift, and thank you for coming. God bless you. If you're a follower of Jesus, walk in the joy of salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a great week.